go ahead and have a seat. Welcome to Village Church. If this is your first time here, my name is Steve, one of the pastors here at Village Church. And as always, I'm thankful and grateful to see each and every one of you. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it to Matthew chapter 22. We're going to be starting in verse 36 this morning. Uh, but when we deal with January, it gives us an opportunity, and I like to take that opportunity every year to discuss kind of forming a vision for the growth that you're going to encounter this year or the opportunities to grow this year. And when we talk about stuff like that, we necessarily have to talk about the issue of change and specifically the change that you need in your life. And when we talk about change, you might get uncomfortable because a lot of people struggle with the concept of I need to change. And some people will go so far as to say, oh, you know, I'm uncomfortable with change. Or maybe you're even so aggressive as to say, I don't want to change or I'm not going to change or this is just who I am. This is just how I am. And when you live like that, and when you say things like that, I, I don't think that you mean what you're actually saying, because when you refuse to change, you're refusing to grow. And when you refuse to grow, that means you're refusing to follow Jesus. The life of a Christian is one that continually necessitates change because growth by its very nature requires you to continuously seek change for the purpose of becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. And just Christianity as a whole shows that we are people who need change because we believe that we're born into this world sinful and that we are a people who struggle with sin and who struggle to obey God. And the reality of becoming a Christian is, is that you cry out to God, I need you to save me or to say it the biblical way, I need you to redeem me. And what you're saying is, God... I need change. And you do. And he does. And the resurrection means that he offers to each of us a new life. Well, there's no new life without change. And so if you are in here and you don't want to change, then stop calling yourself a Christian. Because you're not. Christians live lives of continuously evolving change where we refuse to use our natural tendencies or even our default personalities as an excuse to not become more and more like Jesus Christ. And here's the deal. I know that you're not Jesus. And so that means that if you're going to be a Christian, you're going to have to start growing to become like Jesus. And that requires change. And it's extremely difficult for some of you. And the reason that I say all that is that the topic that we're going to talk about this morning is having a vision for loving others. There is no thought, there is no biblical virtue, there is no vision that is going to require you change more than what really is the paramount call of discipleship, and that is to love people. Loving people is extremely difficult, loving people is extremely hard, and loving people will require you change, and if you refuse to change, well, here's the deal, you just aren't going to love people, because people and the love that you're going to have to offer to people is going to require greater sacrifice, is going to require greater change, it's going to require you to move and change for the rest of your life, because I know some of you you could be 40 or you could be 80, and you're trying to say, well, I'm old now, so I'm set in my ways and I can't change. That's so untrue, it's ridiculous, because you're discounting the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you're still alive, and that means you're, you're breathing, then there's still change that you need, and that's why God hasn't killed you yet. All right, The note that you've changed enough is when God kills you. Okay, But until then, you need more change. Loving people is so difficult because it requires you to love an imperfect person who's not going to do everything the way that you want them to do. And for you to be loving to them is going to require you to probably change what you do before they're ever going to change what they're doing. And again, that necessitates change. And here's the reality of how Jesus talks about that type of change in Matthew chapter 22. There's a group of Pharisees that are trying to uh, trip Jesus up, and one of them is a lawyer, 
And he comes and this Pharisee says, what is the greatest law? And when he asks him that, he's not asking him that from a good motivation. He's asking him that from a bad motivation. He's trying to trip Jesus up. He's trying to get Jesus to say something wrong so they can hold him accountable for it. They're trying to get Jesus to hold one aspect of the law higher than another aspect of the law. But here's how Jesus answers it in wisdom. In verse 37, Jesus says, You shall love your, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. He's quoting Deuteronomy. He's quoting Leviticus. And they're fine with that. And you probably are fine with that, at least at this point, because you're like, well, yeah, the Bible says to love God. But then Jesus continues in verse 39. He says, a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. So Jesus says, love God and love others. And on those two reality hangs everything that is ever said in the entirety of Scripture. And that's why it's called the great commandment. And so Jesus, in all of his wisdom, is able to answer it in such a way that he upholds the beauty and the perfection of God's law, but also challenges them on their interpretation of it, because they would say, we're supposed to love God, even at discounting the value and love of other people. And Jesus answers it by saying, these two commandments are not that dissimilar. That's what he means when he says, the second is like it. And because of that, number one this morning, the call to love others is the call to discipleship. The call to love others is the call to discipleship. Jesus is saying every command in Scripture falls under one of two categories. Love God, love others. There's really no other subject in the Bible except those two things. Every law either is about your relationship with God or, is it, about, or it is about your relationship with with other people, and there is no in-between. And so, if you're going to build a life in which you're going to love other people, it is going to require you to understand first, what does it mean to love God? Because you cannot love other people truly without loving God. Because if you try to do that, then you're going to define love by something other than what God has shown you in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So I want to explain two things here. The first one, why God says to love him. And the second one is why that is necessary for you to ever love anybody else the right way. God doesn't want wooden obedience. God isn't interested in wooden submission. God isn't interested in you just robotically obeying the commands that he gives you with no affection for him. God wants you to love him, and he wants your obedience. He wants your submission to his lordship that we talked about last week. He wants everything to flow out of love for him. Therefore, he commands even our affections. But he has not just in a vacuum said, love me above absolutely everything else with absolutely everything that you have. Good luck. No, God in his grace gives us a reason to love him. And that's called the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so the great commandment, the half that deals with your relationship with God, is built on the foundation of the work that Jesus was accomplishing there. It's built on the reality that there is a God who loves you to the extent that even while you were dead in your sin, even while you were rebelling against him, even while you were disobeying him, even while you were living life, running away from him, blaspheming his name, He sent God the Son, who was completely sinless, had no sin of his own to die for, to go to the cross, to die for your sin, to pay the penalty for all of your sin against God, and then to rise again to give you the gift of a new life. And what Jesus is getting at here is, that's the kind of God that you look at, and if you believe the gospel, you love God. There is no such thing as faith apart from affection. There is no such thing as faith in Jesus without love for Jesus, because if you have faith in Jesus, that means you look to the gospel and you say, I love the God who would go to those lengths to redeem me. 
And Jesus is saying that when you view your relationship with God, it is always forever going to be through that lens. So he commands our affections. And if you love God, you become a student of God. You become someone who wants to become like God. Uh, I'm, I'm married, and I've been married for about 15 years, and, I, and, I, and good news is I love my wife. Uh, I hope that's good news to you. But when I began to form a relationship with my life, my wife, I made a decision. I love her, therefore, what matters to her matters to me. What she desires matters to me. What she thinks matters to me. Her plans for life matter to me. The utmost affections and deepest desires of my wife's heart matter to me. And so for the past 15 years, I have been a student of my wife because to love someone is to have everything about them matter to you. There's no cap on how much you want to know about that person. So it is with your relationship with God. What he thinks matters if you love him. What he wants matters if you love him. What he desires, what he thinks of me matters to me. Where he wants me to find my identity matters to me. What he wants me to do matters to me. And so I am, because of the love that I have for God, I'm to love Him with my heart, with my soul, with my mind, with my strength. I mean, the Bible just puts this this ridiculous, exhaustive list of hyperbole on it that everything that's in me wants everything that is in God to the extent that my affection is so great that if there's a part of my life that I could make more like Him, you know what I seek to do? Change that part of my life so that I can become more like him because I love him. And that's why Jesus says the second is like it. He says that if you love God, you're going to be becoming more like God. And if you're going to be becoming more like God, you are naturally going to love other people. Why? Because the gospel proves one of many, but one important key. God loves people. God loves people. And so if God loves people, that means I love people. And if God loves people, I want to know how God loves people. And here's another grace of God. He shows me how he loves people through the personal work of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so I can root my definition of love and who through the scripture I see God is. And then the ultimate revelation of who God is, is seen in the person and work of Jesus. So I root my definition of love in who Jesus is. And if you will do that, the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love others. Here's the problem you're running into. You are defining your love for others by the wrong things. People typically, and of course this isn't exhaustive, but people typically go wrong with love in one of two ways. You either root your definition of love in your personality or what you are like or what you think you're like, or you root it in your experience. And sometimes people do a combination of both. Here's what I mean. For probably 30% of you, your definition of what it means to love others is rooted in the reality that you're a jerk. And so the only level of love you think anyone should ever expect out of you is they're always going to be getting love that a jerk will give. And so you hold other people accountable to accepting the fact that you are a jerk. And I know what that's like. Because I am not the type of person that, that has ever been codependent, and it's not because I'm that psychologically there. It's just because I'm, not, I'm pretty stoic, I'm unemotional. I am as good in a group of people as I am by myself in my backyard. It's just like, you know, it's one and the same to me. So I have a tendency to really nonchalantly not care what you think. 
And when you're up here, it works out pretty well. But, but in my personal relationships, I have to continuously remind myself, you need to care what other people need. You need to care what other people think. Why? Because love isn't defined by me. Love must be rooted in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So everywhere Jesus wouldn't be like me, guess who needs to change? Not Jesus. Me. I need to change. And so, so many people root their definition of love in their personality, and it is to your detriment, and it is also why you are experiencing so much relational turmoil. Some of you are the opposite of a jerk. You are codependent. And so your definition of love is always going to be defined by how much connectedness every single person will ever give you. And if they have the audacity to want an evening where you're not in their presence, you think everyone hates you because everyone owes you. And so everyone needs to be around you all the time because you're that important. That's just as dumb. Jesus isn't like that. Jesus isn't always holding people accountable to you. He's holding people accountable to Him. Amen. And so if you want to truly love people, you cannot base your definition of love on your personality or what you think you are like. You have to root it in the objective reality of who Jesus is. But there's a second one that I think is more common, and that is defining love by your experience. And usually it's not positive experiences. You base your definition of love on how many times you've been hurt by other people. You base your definition of love on an event or on multiple events that happened to you during your lifetime and everyone else is experiencing the fallout of your hurt. This is the difficult part of love because don't hear what I'm not saying. Your hurt is real. Your hurt matters but your hurt changes nothing about what Jesus says about love and who Jesus is about love. You cannot go through life defining love by your negative experiences and expect to have the type of relationships that God wants you to have. It's not going to happen. You need to find justice for your hurt in the cross of Jesus Christ. Root your definition of love in the greatness of who Jesus is and how loving He is. And then begin to treat others based on Jesus rather than those people or that person in your past who gave you such great relational hurt that you're holding everyone in your life accountable for it. You have to stop that. Everything that God does in Scripture is to bring us to a place where we will define everything on the person and work of Jesus Christ. When we qualify the level of our obedience to the commands of Jesus, we are creating an environment for disobedience no matter the reason. And that's why you need an objective root for love rather than the subjective root of self. Self will get it wrong every single time because you are not perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. Therefore, when you define everything by Jesus, what are you going to get? Perfection. You're going to get the kind of love that you were designed by a loving father to get and a loving father to give. Look at Romans chapter 13, starting in verse 8. It says, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word. Here it is. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfilling the law. Note what he does. He connects love to the law of God. And he says... If you obey the commands of God, if you root love in what God calls you to do, what are you going to do? You are just naturally going to love other people the way that God has called you to love. It's not complicated. It's difficult, but it's not complicated. Most of you are overcomplicating your relationships because you're not rooting what love is in God. You're rooting it in how wacky you think you are. 
Well, here's the deal. If you root it in you, it's going to be wacky. So wacky, no one's going to want to be around you. But if you root it in Jesus, you will experience what real love is all about. But I love the way the Apostle Paul begins that section. He begins it with a few words that almost everyone gets wrong because they treat it as though it is an island to itself. Oh, no one anything. For so many people, and I've had so many people come to ask me, and it's fine to ask me. I'll help you out everywhere that I can. But they'll say, so does that mean we shouldn't get mortgages? <laughs> Look at everything that's written around that. Do you think he's talking about your relationship with a bank? <laughs> no! By the way, get a mortgage. It's fine. It's a good investment. But when he says, oh, no one anything... He connects it to your relationships. And so the question that you need to ask is, why would he say, oh, no one anything, and then go into a diatribe about connecting, loving others with the law of God? Here's why. We have a tendency in our sin to treat people like they are commodities. Here's what I mean by that. Has anyone ever owed you anything? I mean, even if they borrowed like a pair of pants, and didn't return those pants, all right? Even if you bought them lunch and they never bought you lunch in return the next week, they just went Dutch, all right? It can change and it can alter the dynamic of your relationship because in our relationships, we have a tendency to hold things over people's heads. We have a tendency to say, if I gave you $5, even if it was a gift, you owe me. If I gave you something for Christmas that was $50 and you gave me something for Christmas that was $15, you owe me. You obviously don't value this relationship to the extent that I value this relationship. If my neighbor borrows my lawnmower, he owes me. I have something he wants. I bring a value into this relationship that he or she does not bring into this relationship. And we are going to treat our relationship in that vein. Everyone loves it when they're the one that has the power in the relationship, when they're the one that can hold something over someone's head in the relationship, and everyone hates it when they're the one that has something held over their head in the relationship. And what Paul is saying right there is, That's the source of much of your relational turmoil is you're treating people like they're a commodity instead of treating people like they are a recipient of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Stop holding things over people's head and stop letting people hold things over your head. Just love people because they are people. That will also fix half of the marriages in this room. Because you are treating your spouse as though they owe you. You will never have a healthy marriage if you cannot get through that key factor. Stop treating people like that. That is what the Apostle Paul is talking about in this text. Owe no one anything. People are not to be seen as someone that you have power over or someone that has power over you. People are to be seen through the lens of Jesus Christ who seeks to bring grace into everyone's life. To love God is to gain the strength to truly love people, even if it costs you something. Because love cost Jesus something great, didn't it? His own life for the sake of your life. But you're not naturally going to do this, friend. Number two, you need a plan for how you will love others. You need a plan for how you will love others. Your default mode is not love. It's not. And everybody's got that in common. None of you naturally, from the motivation that God wants you to have, are going to live a extremely Christ-centered, loving life. But that's the plan that most of you have. Most of you read a text like this and you kind of close your eyes a little bit and you're like, you know, God, uh, I'm not the most loving person. Please help me to be loving. All right. That's my plan. It's just going to happen. No, it's not. Your default mode is selfishness. 
So if you don't have a plan, you're going to just continue to do selfish things because that's your default mode because you are still someone who is struggling with the reality of sin. Obeying God in any way requires intentionality. And this is true of any of God's commands, but certainly the command to love other people, to put no effort into how you are going to love people will only create a life of self selfishness because you are planning to be very apathetic about the most important command in Scripture. Apathy breeds selfishness. It magnifies you over all others. And then selfishness magnifies what you think everybody owes you, where you think other people should treat you. And so when you are apathetic and when you do not form a plan, you can plan to simply be a selfish person who is weighing the actions of other people and how you benefit from those actions and then treating people thusly. And it also makes you an overly sensitive person. Because you don't have a plan to love others, so you're weighing everything by how other people love you. Are you that type of person? Where before you take a step, you want to make sure they're going to take the first step? Where before you love someone, you want to make sure they're going to speak your love language? A little pro tip. That's called selfishness. And it's our natural default mode. Everyone's the same way. You can see your level of selfishness often by how sensitive you are. I want to preface this because now I'm talking to the sensitive. <laughs> I affirm you. I love you. You matter. But if you are a very sensitive person and you are continuously hurt by things people say and you are continuously offended by what people say, you always feel judged by other people. And everybody needs to treat you better. And you, people need to stop being so mean to you. And how dare someone have an opinion that isn't the exact same opinion that I've spent a lifetime forming? You're a selfish person. It's not because you're virtuous that you're so sensitive. It's because you are a very self-centered person and you want everybody to magnify you rather than magnify the Lord. Your sensitivity is not a virtue that other people need to be held accountable to. The level at which you are offended is the level at which you will experience relational success for the rest of your life. So if, friend, I'm just telling you, if you are easily offended, then you will be offended every day for the rest of your life life. Because nobody is born waking up every day flowing every thought that they have through the filter of you. Here's the reality of my life. I'll probably preach to somewhere over 500 people today. And 114 of those people are going to criticize me before they ever reach their car in the parking lot. <laughs> That's the reality. I went into this job with my eyes wide open. I know the truth. For some of you, I'm going to preach too long. For others of you, I'm not going to preach long enough. For some of you, I'm going to be too theological. For others of you, I'm so seeker sensitive, I'm almost a heretic. For some of you, my jeans are too loose. For others of you, my jeans are too tight. I don't know how they get any tighter and me still be able to talk. For some of you, I'm not formal enough. For others of you, I'm too formal. For some of you, my accent is annoying. For others of you, you just thought he doesn't have an accent. <laughs> All right, look, I know it happens. I walk into it every Sunday morning knowing. That's your conversation this afternoon. You're going to critique. You're going to criticize. Some of you are never coming back. Some of you can't wait to be back next Sunday. That's the reality. Now, please, don't inform me of your criticism before you leave. There is nothing worse than preaching multiple services at multiple locations. And as soon as I'm done and I can take a break, that's when you bring me your complaints. Don't expect it to go well, all right? But here's the deal. 
the reason I know that is because I've criticized so many pastors in my life. <laughs> but, yeah. but I've been in, uh, you know, vocational. In other words, I've had a job in church ministry for over 20 years. And over that time, I just know that that's what happens. And I'm okay with that. But what you need to understand is, is that in that vein, some of you are thinking right now, but Steve, you're a pastor. You have to love people. You have to receive criticism. You have to forgive. But I want you to understand that my first day in ministry, I didn't get that super secret book of the Bible that only pastors get that says we need to love 50% more than everybody else. No, the same calling of God on my life to love is the same calling of God on your life to love. Amen. It's no different. If I have to forgive, and here's the key, even knowing that I'm going to receive criticism today, and even knowing who some of you are that are going to say it, did you know that changes nothing about how much I love you? I know I'm not perfect. I know I could preach better sermons. I know I could dress better. I know I could lose 10 pounds or 20 or 30. Please, let's stop there. I'll, I'll get depressed if we go any further than that, all right? Because I know some of you are like, hey, I heard Steve talking about he was eating Chinese for lunch. Pastors are gluttons. That's just hurtful. No, it's going to be delicious. I got to text my wife. Do you mind if I take a break to do that? No, just kidding. But even in knowing those things, here's the deal. I love you the same. We're in this together. That changes nothing because I realize that who I am is rooted in Jesus Christ. And I understand that the love that I need to give you is also rooted in the same Jesus Christ. We're in this together, therefore I love you. Look in Galatians chapter 5. You were called the freedom brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity to the flesh. And pause right there. The way most people read that text is they will say, okay, don't use your freedom as an opportunity to the flesh. Don't drink, don't curse, don't kiss the girls that do. All right? That's how we, we read that. We, we get this, this arbitrary list of morality and immorality, and we say, see, I don't do these immoral things, or I don't do these moral things, therefore I'm not using it as an opportunity to the flesh. Why don't you read the rest of the sentence? He says, don't use your, your freedom as an opportunity to the flesh, but through love serve one another. That qualifies what he meant at the beginning of the sentence. It's not that morals don't matter. It's just that in this specific instance, that's not specifically what he's talking about. What he's saying is, don't use your freedom as an excuse to selfishness. Your freedom frees you from the sin that causes selfishness. So now you have the freedom to do what? Love and serve other people. Verse 14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Some of you only focus on the end of that verse, and it's because you've experienced hurt. It's because you've experienced pain, even within the body of Christ. And so you look at that and you say, see, I've got to protect myself because people are going to try to bite, people are going to try to devour, and i got to watch out so that I'm not consumed. That's not Paul's posture. Paul is warning you that there are going to be people that walk into your life. There are going to be people that are going to walk through the doors of the building of a church, and they're going to have bad motives. They might be wolves in sheep's clothing. They're going to seek to bite and devour you but that changes nothing about what Paul started with. Serve one another. I've been in this long enough that I can meet some people and within about three minutes of our conversation, I realize this person is not here for good motives. This person is probably going to betray me. This person is probably going to seek to maybe even make me lose my job. 
this person is probably going to try to hurt me or hurt someone else. And Paul says, serve that person. Love that person. Help that person. I walk into every relationship with the reality that there is a chance that at some point down the road that person is going to hurt me because I've been hurt, I've been betrayed, I've had people that I trusted totally betray my trust. But God says, love doesn't change. Love that person. Care for that person. And pray that the love that you show that person will be a witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ in their life and they will repent and they will change. That's the reality. If you go through your life constantly protecting yourself from experiencing pain from other people, you are not going to grow the way that God wants you to grow. Like I said, I've been hurt, I've been betrayed, I've had people betray my trust. Here's the deal. But I still trust. But I still love but I still serve. I still seek to love every single person that God in His sovereignty brings into my life because I believe that every single person that God brings through the doors of that church, that, uh, that doors of this church is a person that God wants to show His sovereign love to through me. And God wants you to have the same vision for yourself. But He wants you to have your eyes wide open. I made a mistake a couple of years ago and I blame my wife. <laughs> Happens frequently. I downloaded this app called Nextdoor. And it's hell's version of Facebook. I hate that app. Here, here's why. This is a safe place, right? I don't care that you lost your cat. I actually don't want to know. I don't care that your dog's gone. I'm not looking for Fido. And if I see him... I'm going to say, hey, there's that dog they're looking for. All right, let's go home. That's, that's my, and I'm not going to go in next door. All right, here's the thing. They weren't gunshots. All right, they're fireworks. It's always, you live in Woodlake. No one's shooting an AK-47 in Woodlake. It's always fireworks, friends, every time. But I digress. All right. Honey, I, like, I think it's gunshots. No, it's not. It was me shooting off fireworks. <laughs> but here's the funniest thing that I've seen on Nextdoor, and it's tragic to me, is I will see people post on the Nextdoor app, and they will say, you know, we've got these plans for Friday night. Is anyone available to watch our kids? And I immediately see that. I'm like, are you nuts? Do you know how many psychopaths are in this world? And you're just sewing a blanket request? Anyone with a pulse want to watch my kids this Friday night? No, don't do it. I walk into relationships with my eyes wide open. I'm not going to let just anyone watch my kids. I'm not going to let 96% of you watch my kids, all right? I have my eyes open. I know what a dark world we live in. So when I'm talking about loving other people, I'm not saying be stupid, all right? If you want to watch my kids, it's an easy process. It involves a lie detector test, a background check, a drug test, and I am going to waterboard you for a half hour to get the truth out of you, all right? So you probably don't want to watch my kids. But I walk into relationships with my eyes wide open. I understand that there are people that are going to hurt me because there have been people that have hurt me. I understand that I need to really keep my eye on some people because of the, 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 the damage they could do to the rest of the body of Christ, but that doesn't change anything about the fact that they need to be loved by me. Yes. Not by somebody else. By me. And they need to be loved by you. People need to have the opportunity to hurt you. And that is the way of love in the gospel. So the fact is, is that love grows. It makes you more vulnerable. It creates accountability. And it builds a functioning community. See, you need a plan. 
See, if you started this year and you just said, I'm going to love people this year, and you didn't make a plan, you're not going to love people this year. You need to sit down and you need to write out five ways that you're going to love people this year. And for some of you, it needs to start with one step. For some of you, you have no intentional um, environment in which you enter into for relationships to be built in your life. You have none. And so today we have GroupLink, and you need to go find a group at GroupLink today. And that can be step one in your plan because it's going to put you in environments for relationships in your life. Look in Romans chapter 12. Number three this morning, loving others forms a life of mission. Forms a life of mission. Look at what the Apostle Paul writes. Now, he's just said the coffee cup verse, be transformed by the renewal of your mind, be a living sacrifice. And he says this, by the grace of God given me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Wouldn't that fix a lot of relationships? Most of you think more highly of yourself than you should, and it's why no one likes you. But think with sober judgment, each according to the measure that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Do you see that? You have two options. You can view yourself as an individual, or you can view yourself individually, members one of another. One is biblical and will bring growth. The other is selfish. Your choice. He continues. He says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. See, you're trying to find people that are exactly the same as you. You're never going to grow if everybody that's around you is the exact same way as you are. That's not the way God designed it. God designed us to have different gifts, different abilities, different personalities. And he says, when we bring them together, we're the body of Christ. He says, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Note this. Outdo one another in showing honor. How much different would your life be when instead of viewing the world through what people should do for you, you just sought to show as many people honor as you could? Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. It fascinates me that he builds this amazing vision. It just builds and it builds and it builds. And then he finishes with two of the most practical ways to love people that you will ever see in Scripture. He says, this is how you accomplish that. Two simple things. And most of you, you've got this view, i got to go big, or I'm going to go home. I want to love people, so I'm going to start a nonprofit this year, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> no, you're not. Do these two things, and it will change your life forever if you do it with faith in the gospel. He says, contribute to the needs of the saints. It's very simple. He says, if you see someone in your church body who has a need, and you, by God's grace, are blessed to have the ability to meet that need. Meet it. Meet it. It's that simple. It's hard, but it's not complicated. Be generous, and don't qualify your generosity. Give out of what God has blessed you with. Commit this year. So when there is a need that I can fill, I'm just going to meet it. But then he says a second thing. He says, seek to show hospitality. See, some of you are waiting for the opportunity to show hospitality. Is that what the text says? Oh, it says, seek it. It says, plan for it. It says, go for it. And he's saying, 
You enter into the lives of others to be hospitable, and you receive others with hospitality. You seek to make people comfortable. You seek to give, show people a good time. You seek to feed. You seek to laugh. You seek to be with and enjoy other people at cost to your leisure. What is your plan to show hospitality this year? How are you going to receive people? And how are you going to be received by people this year? Because it's both. Here's the reality. Some of you have lots of excuses as to why you're not in community with other people. And here, we've created environments for that. The biggest environment that we push people towards is community groups. And if you don't want to go to a community group, that's not my problem. You're in this church, and we're going to keep pushing you. That's just what we're going to do. But I'll tell you straight up. If you continue to say, I can't go to a community group because I've got to work every single night of the week. No, you don't. No, you don't. We have them almost every single night of the week in Powhatan, in the West End, in Chester, in Midlothian. I think we're starting one in Northern Virginia soon. No, just kidding. That would be weird. I'm going to that one. But if you just come up with reason after reason after reason, after a while, I know the truth. You don't want to love people. If you go to a group and this personality type doesn't mesh with your personality and this person gives too many prayer requests and I don't want to hear about their prayer needs all the time and this, that, or the other thing. And you just go to group after group after group and none of them meet your standard. Do you want to know what the truth is? You're selfish. Because every reason that you're avoiding community is about you and your needs and what you want and what others, how others treat you and on and on. Some of you, you won't go to a community group because it lasts past your kid's bedtime. Friends, if you want to show your people what it means to... If you want to show your kids just one small sacrifice for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not going to kill them to stay up late one night a week. Come at me. We'll talk. I got three small kids. And guess what? Multiple nights a week they stay up late because we're in so many communities. And guess what? I took them to the pediatrician. And I expected him to say that if they stay up late one more night, their heads are going to explode. But they keep saying, my kids are fine. And I'm like, that goes against every blog I've ever read. <laughs> now, friends, these aren't big things, but we treat them like they're huge deals. But we need to have our standards set in the order that God wants us to have them. And loving people can't just be a mystical, spiritual, pie-in-the-sky reality. It needs to be tangible. Jesus didn't mystically and spiritually die for me. He physically died for me. Yep. It cost him materially to die. Therefore, the way of Christ is for me to sacrifice to love others. Yes. And if you want to grow in 2020, you will too. Every Sunday, we reflect on the Lord's Supper. And when I think about Romans 12, the bread represents the broken body of Christ. The cup represents His shed blood. He gave generously to my need of salvation. And He did it in a real, tangible way. But then also, he invites me to come to his table and he shows me amazing hospitality by filling my needs. And when you reflect in communion, that's what you're reflecting on. The generosity of Christ, the hospitality of Christ. These were all required requirements of redemption. This morning, if you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you're a follower of his, come celebrate how good Jesus has been to you, then go and show the world how good Jesus wants to be to them. When you're ready, come.